Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the sketching school. Um, we're going to start today with uh, Douglas. I'll just have a, a few announcements. Thank you, Kristen. I'll, I'll be brief so we can get to the sketching school. I did want to welcome everybody, um, but also to, to share with you that, um, as many of you know, we are putting together a proposal, a major proposal, to keep the Global Studio going. We call it Global Studio 2.0. Um, and we have had overwhelming amounts of support. Um, the proposal is due on Thursday, and we're sort of just bringing in the last letters. If it's not too late, though, if anybody wants to participate, again, I'll put my um, email address into the uh, the chat box. Uh, but we have now, oh, I think we have 27 different partners from around the world, uh, all putting in all manner of kind of cash and in kind. It's uh, it's quite wonderful to see the responses that we've got. But as I say, if anybody else, any other organizations or individuals would like to be part of this and want to provide a letter of support, we would be delighted to have you. Um, the only other thing I, I wanted to say is that, um, you know, this putting this online cross-cultural sketching school together was an enormous amount of work. And again, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes how much work that um, uh, Kristen and David and Henry in particular did in order to make this happen, but also the guests like uh, Chris Cornelius today uh, and others who have worked so hard to make this happen. And I'm really looking forward to the results. So thank you very much everybody for attending. And uh, we'll look forward to doing all sorts of events like this if we get the additional funding. Over to you, Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Kornienko. I'm the coordinator of the collaboration that is the Global Studio. And um, we're really excited to have Chris joining us today for the, for the second session of the teaching of the sketching school. Um, I'll just start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm privileged to look out at a beautiful lake on lands formerly known as the Salish region of Turtle Island today known as interior British Columbia within the political boundaries of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm a fifth generation white settler now living and working as an uninvited guest on the lands of the Sequatmec Nation and that I benefit from the intergenerational wealth of land ownership. I'm a squatter on these lands. The region was not negotiated by treaty and remains to this day unceded. Immediately around where I stay, this includes the people of the Splatchine, Nisconlet, and Squilax bands. Kuxchem, or thank you. A, Spl a Splatchin band council member described the Sequepmec traditional lands to me as roughly de defined by the Shushwap Lake watershed and occupied since time immemorial by the nation's diverse cultures. There is archaeological evidence of their presence dating back over 15,000 years. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the ancestors and people of these bands for their ongoing inclusive activities towards healing and conciliation and in the defense of their land, water, and creatures of this region. I'd also like to acknowledge that within these traditional lands is Te Kamloops and the site of the Kamloops Residential School, where the first of the unmar unmarked mass graves was found on residential school sites across Canada. I also live and work in Egoli or Johannesburg, South Africa, on Veld, that is the traditional lands of the San and the Soto Tuana peoples. <clears throat> I learned in the course of my research that significant gold deposits were discovered in both these locations within four years of each other in the mid 1850s, triggering colonial mechanisms of land appropriation, displacement of communities thousands of years old, cultural assimilation and imperial resource extraction. I'd like to hold a space for just a moment to think about and honor the reality of what this land acknowledgement means and challenges us to act on. McGill University has held a sketching school uh, since 1921. The last, uh, last year, David, uh, Kovo generously offered to share this practice with the Global Studio in partnership with our faculty member, Hem Henry Tsang. In weekly meetings since last summer, we've posed the question among ourselves and with collaborators, how could the sketching school be reimagined to address equity and justice in architectural representation? 
as has been raised by speakers over the last year in the global studio, as well as in the larger global dialogues and demanded by our students. Here in Canada between 2007 and 2015, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a practice modeled after South Africa's apartheid Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Here it addressed the legacy of colonialism and Indian residential schools, the last of which closed in 1996. The TRC found the government of Canada and its colonial actions and policies guilty of cultural genocide against the diverse cultures of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples across Turtle Island, now called Canada. Canada's final TRC report calls on governments, educational and religious institutions, civil societies and Canada and, and Canadians themselves to take action on the 94 calls to action it, it identified. Our intent is that curriculum change is a, is a first step towards addressing these calls to action. But specifically, I'd like to point to, um, to action 63.3, which states the need for building student capacity for intellectual understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. As part of this process, I, asked, I found myself asking, what does it really mean to decolonize? I looked inside myself at my own privilege, and then I turned to the wisdom of others. The works of Aaron Mills, a member of the Bear Clan Anishinaabe and a professor of indigenous law at McGill, and his term to be in right relation. He references Anishinaabe elder Fred Kelly, who said, part of is not reduced to within creation, we're all unique. Instead, he states, ours is the gift and the struggle to stand side by side different and together. In my role as teacher on to, to the ongoing re relevance of anti-apartheid activist Steve Biko's statement that the most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, as I face up to the falsehoods of our historical and national narratives. To Tyson Yunkaporta of the Apalek clan of Northern Australia, who teaches me to assign protocols to my knuckles on my hands and then touch my fingers together to work on living in relationship. He speaks of the need for cultural humility and of addressing the power relations between indigenous and non-indigenous knowledge systems. And in my own efforts to learn and unlearn, I remind myself of Shundana Youssef's words that opening ourselves to listening to those who practice spaces and ideas differently than ourselves is critical to decolonization of ourselves and our students' minds. And I look to the prevalence of English across what we do. And I say to myself, unga kulumi isi ingisi, or stop, uh, uh, stop speaking in English all the time, which our friends in Cliptown hopefully understood. In this series of workshops and feedback sessions over the next four, next three weeks now, sketching will be presented as a process that frames how we document knowledge and understand the world around us and how this informs architectural design. But this begs the question, who, from whose frame? How can we shift the largely Western dominance over spatial ideas and understandings? How as architects do we learn to see and draw across cultural differences without reduced reduction? How do we find humility to acknowledge that a group of white settlers can be perceived as violence in some communities? How is the landscape drawing changed when a rock is treated as a sentient being and a knowledge keeper rather than an object or simply something to sit on while sketching? For those of us like myself, who are white settlers, how do we learn to find the humility to move forward in a way that is not simply a more palatable reframing of assimilation? As David, Henry, and I had our final meeting two weeks ago, we agreed that this workshop remains a work in progress. We continue to grapple over these types of questions as we work to bring real change to curriculum so as to value racial and gender identities, cultures and worldviews, and to shift paternalism and privilege. We admitted to each other that there will be moments of dis disconnect and discomfort 
as this is an experiment and we learn and we are learning and unlearning together over the coming weeks. But there is also hope and beauty in this process. In each of the teaching workshops, there will be three perspectives. Henry and David will be there each week. Last week we had Sechaba Mape. This week, Chris Cornelius. Then it will be Joanna Nash and Chibuzo Chanehe. Each of these people bring different approaches and life experiences to drawing and how drawing informs architecture. For some, this may be deeply rooted in their own personal and painful histories, as well as our collective histories of cultural genocide, slavery, and social constructs of white supremacy. As teachers, we speak of providing safe spaces for these conversations. But the recent work of Sykes and Gachago on safe teaching, uh, on safe learning spaces, reminds us that caring is a fundamentally relational activity that happens in a web of reciprocal relationships. In other words, we need a solidarity amongst ourselves to support participants' openness and courage. Conversations around decolonization can be triggering. I've put a contact in our, to our student mental health team in the Sketching School mural board. Please uh, reach out if you feel you need to. And finally, we are really excited that 20 youth from the Splatchin um, Chimaltzen Society here on the Sekwapmak Nation uh, as a teaching center at, of the traditional, on the traditional lands will join us as well as seven youth from Cliptown Soweto in South Africa. This is a project to share architecture and architectural and drawing skills in the hope that they might dream of becoming architects. Cooksjam to Aaron Leon, the director of the Splatchin Chimaltsen Society, and Ngia Bonga Gakulu to Tavang Nkwanyana, the director of 1955 Creative Collaboration in Cliptown for helping make this happen. And thanks to Douglas and uh, Opus Art Store in Kelowna who supplied the, uh, all, the art, um, all the art supplies for, this, for the youth. All of the teaching and feedback sessions will be recorded and have made available on the Global Studio. And it's been great to see we already have over 50 people that have watched last week's recording. Additionally, we have put together the Miro board, which I have here, pulled up here on the screen with links to, um, other, to further resources. Thank you again, everyone, for uh, who has helped to make this happen. And please enjoy the drawing and feel its power of healing. Before I pass this session to Chris, I'd like to suggest that we spend a few minutes at the end of today to discuss the feedback sessions. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of turnout this week, and so we just would like to talk with people about what might make them feel more comfortable to share their work on the mural board. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Chris Cornelius. Shakoli and Yao, hello and thank you for your collaboration with the Sketching School today. Chris is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and has recently accepted the position as chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of New Mexico, which is where I went to architecture school. So that makes it particularly interesting. He is the founding principal of Studio Ind Ind Indigenous, a design practice serving indigenous clients. There is a link to his beautiful and thought provoking as well as award-winning work on the Miro board, which I strongly encourage everyone to have a look at. Months ago, I had a conversation with David Fortan for, about the sketching school. And he said to me, if you wanna to talk to a person doing extraordinary drawings, then you need to talk to Chris Cornelius. So, we, so thank you again. And generously, Chris has, has been part of this process from the very start as he was at the very first meeting of how to reimagine the sketching school. So again, I say, yo. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Chris. Yeah, we'll go. Uh, Chris Neon gets Aquahoni Wagito Loda Okale Oneata Aga Lavagadon Choda. Wakuf Noela do. And so I said in Oneida that I extend my greetings, love, and thankfulness to all of you. I am Chris Cornelius of the Wolf Clan, and people of the Standing Stone is the earth that I come from. Um, 
So I, you know, I have to say that one of my, aside from drawing, well, one of my favorite things to do is to talk about drawing. Um, I got the right, sorry, the right screen. Screen this morning. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes, we see we see it show? now and we see it now in full screen. It's good. Okay. Sorry. So what when I talk about my work, and I've been very fortunate to um, lecture all over the world, uh, basically, um, and I I can usually only get to talk about drawing a little bit uh, about my about my work and one of the ways that I talk about it and frame it is to say that drawing is medicine. Um, I think that it is uh, part of the ceremony of design for me. Um, it's a thing that helps me feel better and it's a way for me to begin to try to reconcile myself with the world right uh, and and as a person that's designing things and physical objects and spaces and places. Um, drawing is the place that I usually start um, to, to do that. And so for me, the um, idea or notion of how I begin to draw, I started to really um, at some point, and I would say it's probably 15 plus years ago, I decided that, uh, you know, as a, as a designer looking at a blank page, I think we've uh, missed a step a little bit because we always think about how we conceive of a thing in our minds and then we try to draw that thing as opposed to can the actual act of drawing help us design the thing. Um, and so I started to draw um, things that I hadn't thought about before, meaning like it, I find that if I am drawing, um, I'm thinking. And so as I'm drawing, um, things will come out. And so I don't always have to like think of what the thing is before um, I actually draw the thing. So it started to make me think about objects, things, um, things I was building or making um, quite differently because the, the drawing itself um, helped me understand that. And I also think that, you know, and I tell students this all the time, your drawings aren't for everyone, right? They're, they're primarily for you uh, as, as the designer of the thing. So whether you exhibit them, show them, um, or whatever, that's that's completely up to you. So there are many pages in my sketchbooks like these where I'm just working through ideas. Sometimes it's actually just about media. Um, and this one, I wondered like, what if I used a white out pen uh, and scribbled over uh, a drawing um, or how I'm, what sort of watercoloring technique I'm using um, in, in my sketchbooks, what colors look best and those kinds of things. Um, so, I think that we we draw how we think, meaning like if an idea comes to us, uh, at first it's not it's not formulated, right? It, it might just be a sort of hunch, a sense, um, a, a feeling, uh, a wondering. Um, and so what you're looking at in these pages are some of that. But once those ideas start to get more concrete, um, and so if I started to think about a particular form, um, I begin to think about how um, that thing works. And then I start to darken that in. I start to highlight it in some way. I start to um, think about how it be becomes um, a thing. And so I also don't erase any anything. Um, I just redraw the thing, right? Like if so, if something isn't quite right to me, I just start over. I think again, uh, as those ideas become more concrete to us or become more resolved, um, we draw them in ways that, that start to um, start to become more more apparent. And so I use you know my sketchbook in, in a number of ways, one for generating ideas, but two when I'm working on projects, you can see even here I'm looking at and exploring building details, right? Um, this particular drawing was for a project. Um, I was asked to design a, um, a basically a building to house the boiling of maple sap into syrup, which was part of our, our tribe's um, ceremony, annual ceremony. And so they wanted a structure to be able to teach the uh, elementary school uh, students to do that. And when I had this conversation early on in the project, one of the teachers, the teacher that does this, um, she talked to me about like how our tribe doesn't tell stories about the sky anymore. Uh, and I asked her to tell me one of those stories. And she told me the story of the seven dancers. 
so I, I begin to think about, well, how do I, how do I begin to understand that? I, I write it uh, out in the sketchbook. Um, I begin to think about what if this, this thing that I'm designing is an aperture through which these seven uh, young boys uh, who were dancing, danced so hard, they went into the sky, they became the Pleiades, um, or we call them the seven dancers. Uh, what if this architecture was an aperture for that? So in some cases, when I'm asking these fundamental what if questions, I, I'm trying to draw through them um, as well. You know, or is it a, it's, sometimes it's about form finding, it's about how I begin to think about um, forms, shapes, uh, things that, 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 that I'm designing. Um, it, for me, is really a way of, of thinking through things. And for me, I, I really began to realize that um, we, as, as designers, we're not always cognitively using all parts of our brains. And so what I'm trying to do is to tap into that idea where um, I'm not making a judgment or assessment of what is coming out as, as the drawing, right? Um, I'm just trying to get it on the page. Um, and it, once it's out in the, on, in the page, then I can make a the, the design decision about uh, whether it's good or it's bad or it's something I want to use or, um, or not. So oftentimes I'll try to work through ideas. Um, this one, I was beginning to explore some of my own work and how I was using um, uh, installation work uh, as, as a sort of physical land acknowledgement and what that actually meant. Um, how should it actually uh, manifest itself in form? Should it look like an animal? Should it not? Um, uh, does it look like something else? And beginning to, to do that. I often do this too when I'm reading things. I assign readings to my students or I'm reading new things, things that I'm trying to understand. I'll be in my sketchbook actually drawing and Sort of mapping out ideas, and so that I can begin to understand uh, understand them. Um, a few years ago, I started this research project um, where I was examining the American Indian occupation of Alcatraz Island, which happened from November of 1969 to June of 1971. And as I began to really sort of research it, and, and I wrote a grant proposal that was funded, uh, and in the grant proposal. Um, I suppose that they got what they wanted in the occupation and they didn't want the island just for political or sort of financial um, gain. What they wanted to do was to create a, a native university, ecological center and cultural center. And I found it really interesting that they wanted architecture um, basically um, to, to, be, to be on the island. So in my grant proposal, I proposed that they got what they wanted. Um, they got part of the island to, um, to have a native university and I was going to design that university. But as I started to get into the complexities of, of that uh, occupation, looking at um, uh, demonstrations and, and activism um, and indigenous culture, it's very complex, uh, it becomes very, very complex. And so I started to really think to myself, well, I have to draw differently and, and differently than I had been drawing before. Um, and so I created a series of drawings. This is one of them, and it's called. This one is called trajectories, where I, I themed the, the drawing. Um, in this case, I'm just thinking about the idea of trajectories. And so I started by drawing every edge of every building that was on the island uh, off the page. Right. I had uh, an instrument that was it's so long, and I used it every page, uh, every edge of that. I draw these on mylar. Um, with the one you're looking at here is about three different sheets of mylar drawn the front and the back. This is how I learned how to draw uh, in architecture school in the 90s. Um, our school was very big on ink on mylar. Um, and so I started drawing on, on mylar uh, during that time. Um, so for me, what I'm trying to do is to use the tools that I've learned as, as an architect and designer um, and, and how can I leverage those tools into thinking about things quite differently. And so what I'm trying, also trying to do, and I didn't quite realize it at the time, <clears throat> and so uh, what I have sort of thought about as I began to reflect on it, what I'm really trying to do is tap into what indigenous knowledge is and as a sort of system. And so the academic in me uh, begins to think about what that is. And we talk about it, uh, epistemological systems or systems of knowledge. And in indigenous knowledge, we value um, things like dreams, hallucinations, visions, stories as fact. Um, we see them as, as clear as data or history or uh, any other science, any other sort of thing that you would uh, value as a, a knowledge system. And so what I'm trying to do is to then to think, well, as a designer, how can I use my own hunches or thoughts? 
Um, and in some cases, what you're looking at is just me liking to draw things in a particular way or inventing ways of understanding um, things. Like I had to begin to think about how was I going to represent sound? Um, how was I going to begin to think about how um, the, the island itself still acts as a thing in the harbor and has sound on it? Or different ways that uh, I was, the, the different types of maps that I was getting, like uh, navigational maps, aeronautical maps, um, and how was I going to trace those and, and begin to, to represent those? In some cases, it's really about just the, the sort of um, ritual of, of drawing. And so I began to think about how would I perhaps index things in a way that I'm not really saying whether this thing in the water is in the water, it's above the water, it's in the air, it's, it's an animal, it's a fish, it's a bird, it's technology. Um, I like to use notation in a way that is completely sort of improvisational in, um, in a way. Um, I use a lot of tools that I use when I learned to draw, and so I have an entire collection of these dry transfer letters, numbers, and things that we used to be able to, we used to have to label our drawings with these like rub on uh, dry erase things. And so I have tons of those. Some of them are numbers, some of them are mathematical symbols, but I put them in, in the drawing as I'm, I'm drawing it. So sometimes you see things like the white ink up here. Um, those things add life to the drawing. It's in this particular drawing, I didn't know what to draw, so I started drawing or tracing other things. And I'm, when, when I show you these kinds of drawings too, it's not just the, the sort of analog drawing of the thing. I'm actually doing a lot of digital work. They do a lot of work in Illustrator and other things, and then I begin to trace them uh, in, uh, on, the, on the sort of mylar. I also started to experiment with the ways that I was photographing and documenting the work, that it wasn't always a sort of top down, like flat view of the drawing, um, because I, I was really interested in the drawing surface. When I put the sheets of mylar back together, um, it's important to me whether I draw on the front or the back and how we begin to see that. What happens if I put physical things in the world and whether it's a scale animal like this or it's a, it's a model or whatever that has a relationship with, with the thing. Um, for me, it's a, it's a way of understanding that greater relationship between the drawing and the physical object. Um, I like to draw dashed lines. It's almost like meditative for me. Um, and so um, when I'm teaching students how to do this, I, I just basically say it's just something that you kind of get good at. And it's okay if you need to print out something, right? Like print it, make a series. And I have sheets like that too, but sheets of dashed lines and then you put the sheet underneath it and then draw over it. Um, all of it is really just kind of using a similar language to the language that we've understood as architects, right? Where a line actually means something because when it's in a construction document, it's, it's contractual, right? It's, it's something that we understand is when a dashed line is there, is that something that's below me? Is that something that's above me? Is that something behind a wall that I can't see that I need to know about? Um, in the same way that, that those, those things are acting, um, I'm trying to do that with these drawings. In many ways, what I'm trying to do is to make the thing mean multiple things, right? That that multiple truths can can exist, um, and so um, that those are the kinds of things that that I'm that I'm thinking about when I'm when I'm doing these drawings. Before this, I had done a series of drawings like like this, and I call these the the domicile series. Um, it's a series of drawings that that I decided to do all in elevation. So these four elevations, I did them in my sketchbook. Um, I didn't want to, what I was working against was this idea that every sort of architectural act or thing designed for indigenous people has to be a metaphor of being indigenous. Um, how can I embed the, the ways that indigenous people think and, and how I think uh, into, into the drawings? Um, these drawings are layered. I'll show you in a minute um, the different sort of layers of them. Um, but I decided that they were all displaced from the ground the same amount. Um, they all had a top. They all had some way of getting into it. They all had these antennae that, that may uh, communicate with one another. So they may be um, utilitarian or they might just be decorative, right? And so what you'll notice is I started to ask myself a lot of questions that I didn't need to answer. I just needed to draw the possibilities of. Um, and so I wasn't worried about, about that. And one of the, the things that started all of this sort of way of thinking for me was in 2003, I was selected as the artist in residence for the National Museum of the American Indian. And my proposal was to draw my tribe's creation story as an architect, because I saw the, um, 
the creation story as specifications for construction of the world. Um, it was a thing that told me um, how the world was, how we got here, what happened before, um, and, and those kinds of things. And in our, in our story, there's a sky world that's above this world. Um, and so when I began to draw that sort of section, I didn't know how far the sky world was, right? So I had to kind of speculate on that. And in the story, um, the, there's a white pine that gets uprooted and creates an aperture into this world, the world that we exist in. Um, the story tells me how thick that layer needs to be because of that, because of that event. And so I depicted that event. A turtle emerges, a, a sky woman is thrown through the hole. She comes down to this world and she lands on the back of the turtle. Um, so all of that was just, just ways of, for me to begin to think about how I was going to draw that. But an important um, counter uh, part to those drawings was my sketchbook. And this is the first time I started to really begin to draw how, how and think through how I was going to represent these things. And, and here you can see that I'm looking at how I lay out the boards. Um, and then this is the drawing that I always use that because this is the one drawing that I started to, this is when I decided I was going to stop erasing things. Um, so I started to draw a turtle in section over here and I realized, well, that doesn't quite look right. Let me stop drawing that. Let me find an actual section of a turtle and then redraw that. Um, and so in the, in the end, I realized that what I had previously drawn was less important and, and not so unimportant that I needed to erase it or for it to not no longer exist. Um, and then I really, that's when I really stopped erasing it in, in my sketchbook. But then I started to think about how was I going to think through, how was I going to show things like, um, things that show up as, as, as decorative beadwork in my culture and the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and what are they called and how is I going to represent on all of that? And that became very important. So when I started this domicile series, I was really trying to tap into this idea um, of that everything I'm drawing doesn't need to be seen or doesn't need to have existed before. And can I use drawing as a way of speculating, as a way of understanding the world? And so in this, this structure, and the, this was the second in the series, um, what if it had, instead of columns, it was like legs, um, like a deer, um, that perhaps the structure just ran there and I turned around. And uh, when I see the thing, th did it just get there or had it always been there? Part of that was, um, and one of the, I think it's one of the reasons I became an architect, as a child on our reservation, there was a structure in the woods um, and there was uh, a whole sort of mythology and story about an entity that was on our reservation. I won't say exactly what the entity was. And I will say that I, I would guess that other people that have, um, and I've talked to other people <laughs> that have grown up on reservations. There are these stories that begin to uh, be told about, about creatures, things that aren't human um, that might be part human, part something else, part animal, some other sort of thing. Um, but I was really fascinated with that structure. Um, it didn't look inhabited, but it didn't look uninhabited. Um, and so the sort of mystery of that structure was a thing that I was trying to tap into in this series of drawings. Um, and so when I, what I realized was that when I started to draw these things, uh, when it came into my head as an idea, I put it on the page. And so when I started to think about the deer's leg, that's when I put the deer, I found a deer leg, a scientific sort of zoological illustration of one, and I put it into this thing. Um, this, is, this was the first one that I did. Um, and this one was where the, these ideas started to kind of um, coalesce. When I started to do this drawing too, what I developed was a series of uh, steps in, in, the, in the drawing. So this was like one of the first steps in in um, the drawing. And what you'll see in the final drawing is that after this step, um, I realized that I didn't want the drawing to be too like precious or pristine, um, that I didn't want to overvalue the final product as much as I wanted to value the process. And so I splashed watercolors on it. Um, that actually became part of this ritual of, of doing these drawings. And so this is the seventh in the series. Um, it's about the, the thunder moon. These are all based on my tribe's moon calendar too. And so what I, again, what I was trying not to do is to make a metaphor for that moon. So this is how they usually start. Um, I will um, draw them out uh, in my sketchbook. I use a moleskin sketchbook. And what I also found after doing the first one um, is that there are pages within the moleskin that are one sheet of paper, right? It's, it's just the way that the thing is made. Um, and so I started to draw all of them in that one page, meaning the page that is that one single sheet of, of, of paper. 
Um, I use a straight edge. I use a sort of rolling parallel line um, ruler. It's a small thing. This this thing um, has has a lot of miles on it, but this is what I use to when I'm when I'm drawing these these pieces. Um, Proportion is important to me, so I, I, I'm actually using golden sections for everything in this entire thing. But this is the second step. Um, so the first step, I draw it in the sort of brown lead, um, and then I'll go over it with graphite, um, darken in uh, those things. After that step is usually when I splash it with watercolor. I like to use a neutral sort of color. Um, part of it is, you know, for me, it's in that sort of idea of the ritual of, of the drawing itself. Um, what I find too is that it gives the drawing a, a sort of life. Um, it's almost like a chef, right? Like you wouldn't make a soup with equal amounts of meat, uh, onions, garlic, and salt, right? You wouldn't put a pound of each of those things and you, you basically kind of season it. Um, and again, when the things come into my mind, I put them into the, into the, um, into the drawing. So I started to think about the top of this, app, this thing, this apparatus, like, like a deer's ear, uh, it needs to hear uh, its predators and I need to hear uh, the, the first clap of thunder if that happens. The com more complex things, and I'll show a, a different version in a minute, uh, the more complex things like these images and things, um, I use, uh, I do a Xerox transfer with a toner transfer. Um, where I use a colorless blender marker that has xylene in it um, that to get the image. So I reverse it in Photoshop, I print it, and you have to use something, a uh, printer, like a laser printer that has toner, you can't use an inkjet. Um, and that's how I got the image in, right? That's how I get the deer's um, head in. But I also, if you notice here, uh, the complexity of this form, I'm making that in Rhino, but then I'm printing that out and putting it on here. I'm using that transfer. And then I go over it with, with my pencil. To begin to kind of um, darken darken that in. So this is the sort of final object. This thing I didn't think I could draw this right. I probably could, but uh, but I wanted it to be the same. And so this was I used a sort of Rhino parametric thing to develop it. But um, but that is the Xerox transfer. But in this particular one, you can see uh, the proportioning system um, of of how far something sticks out, how thick it is, what the openings are is are all determined by. Uh, by that proportioning system, and so um, that is um, in um, in the in the drawings. Um, and then I start to watercolor over it. What I realized too, after seeing many different ways of of how artists work, um, whether it's painting, it's drawing, uh, watercoloring, um, colored pencils, I realized that the the best drawings are layered, meaning like there's layers of paints. I mean, you might paint over something or um, you don't really sort of start over. And that's where I started to approach this thing in this, in this layered sort of methodology um, of, of making these kinds of things. And again, going back to this idea of um, indigenous knowledge, um, that's why I decided to use, uh, I use animals as, instead of people it, for the most part as, as scale figures. Um, again, I, I trying to be vague about um, who made this thing, who designed it, who built it, whether it was an animal, it was a person, it was some other sort of entity, um, were, were all things that, that I was um, particularly uh, interested in. In each one, I treat how it meets the ground, uh, what its structure is made out of, whether it's sticks, it looks like legs, it's columns, it's some other sort of structure. Um, I'm using uh, watercolor masking fluid to make the ground. I dip it in a paper clip and I put it on uh, apply it on, then I watercolor over that. Uh, oftentimes you'll see the ground. Um, I usually do the ground in multiple layers um, and, and whether I'm showing some sort of hidden line of, of this excavation of the thing, um, but that's, that's kind of how I make this. So I've, you know, for me, it's mostly graphite and it's watercolor um, that, I, that I use different colored leads. The things that you see, these sort of circles that are going around this, after the, at the first drawing, when I did the first one, uh, which was this one. At the very end, I, when I was looking at it, I was like, this thing looks like something should be flying around it. Um, and whether that thing was a bird, it was an insect, it was technology, Wi-Fi signals, uh, radio signals or whatever, I didn't need to make that sort of assessment. But what I wanted to do was to, to, to bring that energy into the drawing um, and also do it in a way that made it seem realistic, meaning like, the line itself disappears when it goes behind the object, right? Or this one is coming in front of the object. It's those little things that I think help build the sort of uh, quasi-reality to, to, the, to the piece. And that's why 
Uh, it's something I do. It's the last thing I do on all of these drawings uh, when I when I do each one of them um, in in the sort of series. So I have eight of these completed. I have a ninth one that's been in process for a couple of years, um, and the the this whole series is uh, should be thirteen because there's thirteen moons. Um, and I, it's changed the way that I digitally render uh, as well because I, I do digital renderings of these of these things, and I try to bring some of the similar energy into it. Uh, and uh, I make I, I have a series of physical models of, of these in, in process as well. The last thing I want to leave you with is that that oftentimes when I'm drawing, what I find is that um, I, again I'm trying not to make judgments or assessments about what it is that I'm making. So. Sometimes I'll completely fill a page with this. And really, it's about moving my pencil around and getting that connection between the cognitive connection between my brain and my hand. Um, and so I'm, I fill this entire thing. I call them glyphs because they're just like a glyphic kind of language that I may not understand. Um, there, there might be a kind of utterance. Uh, but I find that it keeps me nimble as 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 I draw, and whether the thing is hatched in or it's smudged or uh, it's cut away in section, it's overlapping one thing. So a drawing like this, um, I'll do in about 15 minutes. I just find fill a sort of page uh, with it, and this is this is a process of of doing uh, one of those. Um, I find for me that it just helps my brain. Um, draw things, right? Um, and it makes me better at this. Uh, it, it, it helped me uh, begin to speculate on, on shapes, forms, the things I like, the things I don't like. Um, and so I do exercises like this with, with my students as well. Um, because what I'm trying to teach students, and I think that we haven't done a great job of it in, in architecture school, is teaching them subjectivity what I like and what I don't like. Why do I like it and why do I not like it? Do I like forms? Do I like shapes? Um, how did I get those shapes or forms? Um, how do I represent ideas? Like all of that is really kind of important in, in the ways that, it, that I think. So for me, when I'm drawing in my sketchbook, and again, um, I'm really thinking about how I begin to um, uh, create these kinds of, of worlds and thinking about uh, anything can be drawn and I just have to invent the way that I want to draw it uh, and to get out of the idea that it has to exist in the world or exist in my mind and then I represent it that the actual representation or drawing of something uh, can be a part of the part of the process itself. Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. That was that was fantastic. I want to pick up my pens and start drawing. Um, and uh, I will pass it over to you, Henry. And just as a reminder, we'll have a chance to ask questions and have a short discussion um, with, with all three of the presenters at, at the end. Um, thanks, Henry. Do you see my slides, Kristen? Well, thank you, uh, Kristen yeah. and Doug, for the introduction, and uh, uh, thank you, Chris, for your fabulous presentation. Um, I'm, I, I feel very inspired by this, and I, I'm, I can't wait to start uh, the next week with some new sketches. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Henry Tsang, and um, I'm one of the uh, coordinators of this program of the Towards uh, Cross-Cultural Sketching School. Um, I'm an architect, a Canadian architect, um, and I am uh, back and forth between Asia and Canada a lot, and I've been working and studying in both, um, both areas, uh, and I'm currently in Tokyo. Um, so, so one thing that has kind of um, uh, been in the background of my, in, in my architectural um, process is my cultural identity, um, being both uh, Canadian and also uh, with parents, immigrant parents from, from Hong Kong, China, and my wife being Japanese. Um, I constantly find myself being a foreigner uh, in, in either places. So when I look at places, I, I kind of look at it as, as a lens that's uh, a little bit more critical. And being also trained in both countries, I was um, trained at McGill University in, in Montreal, and then also uh, at the University of Tokyo in Japan. Um, I, I feel like I see uh, uh, places through both lenses, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. 
So I think that's going to be the basis of, uh, of my presentation of how um, of why this is important that we're talking about this cross-cultural sketching school today and um, how I uh, interpret this in my own uh, practice and uh, teaching. Um, so I was a student of David Covos uh, tw about 20 years ago and we, uh, we used to go on these sketching um, camps called sketching schools um, in different towns in, in, uh, in Canada and we would go and sketch um, the architecture, the places, and the people, and 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 try to understand the places. I think that's very important to understand that um, this sketching school workshop that we're proposing is not a lecture. We're not telling students today that this is the way that you need to draw, or uh, we we're not saying that this is a technique that you have to follow. So that's why it's important that we have people like um, Chris and 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 other speakers to come in that come and show their different perspectives and different techniques and different ways of understanding the world um, and seeing the world and how do they try to capture that on uh, through illustration. Today's workshop is called the Drawing the Unseen. So we're trying to talk about things um, that we can capture on paper that you don't necessarily see. Um, and, and Chris talked very eloquently about um, the indigenous knowledge and how, how does that kind of influence his, his drawings. Um, I like to start here is that, you know, we, we, we like to talk about sketching as architects, but why do architects sketch? And I think Chris also talked about this is that it helps us understand um, the world. You know, I think um, I, myself as well, I don't sketch because um, I have drawings all over my walls, but it, this is usually for myself. It's almost like a way of, um, of how I, I, I keep a journal of, of how, um, of places I've been to, uh, places I've seen and places that, that have interested me. And um, it's a way for me to, to document that and archive that. And as, as an architect, it starts to build a database of of interesting spaces and how people interact with them. So, so these are some of my sketches um, through my travels over the years. Um, and for, for this workshop in the last, uh, since last week and for the next two weeks, I've kind of promised myself that I won't use my old slides because I wanted to take this opportunity to relearn and listen to people like Chris and people like Suchaba um, to, to start to understand the world a little bit differently and, and see how that can influence my own work. So some of these new sketches that I'm doing every week uh, tries to take that into consideration. So um, on, on the right is one of um, my quick sketches that I did last week um, that I showed students because I think it's important that you try to capture uh, the, the character of a place, um, the mood of a place very quickly, because when you're sketching outside, um, it, it, places change, the light, the, the, the shadows start to change, people, people are moving, so it's very important to do the, uh, to do sketches uh, very, very quickly. Um, we also emphasize in this sketching school that it's important to start to understand your own community. So right now I'm based uh, in Tokyo in Koto Ward. And um, last week I sketched uh, the, my own neighborhood, which is called Toyo. Um, and this week I went a little bit further outside of it um, towards the east side uh, in, a, in a neighborhood called uh, Kiba. So Kiba is a very interesting place. Uh, this is a very old um, drawing of Kiba and Kiba translates in Japanese to the wood place, so the place of the wood. What that means is that this, this area historically was um, the place where the lumber industry kind of flourished because uh, when Tokyo was mainly built in the 18th century, um, this is where they kind of collected all the wood and they would use these canals to kind of bring all of the, uh, the timber to, to the construction sites. And they built a lot of bridges and, and buildings, of course. So as an architect, this, uh, this area very far, um, is a very interesting place. Today, this is what it kind of looks like, is that you see these canals 
uh, still very present uh, in, in Tokyo where uh, they used to kind of uh, carry the lumbar. Um, but one, one topic that I want to introduce before I show you the sketches is this, this idea of subject versus object. And when I talk to you about, you know, trying to sketch a place when you're there, you have to Henry, we're not hearing your sound. So, so, yeah. think, and then try to capture this. What's that? We're not hearing your sound very well. well You're really okay. breaking up. Okay. Um, so I'll just stop the, the sound of the, the background for now, just to say that the idea of capturing subject is that everything is moving in a city and it's not an immobile object to acknowledge that there is movement in the sky, there's movement in the water, there's movement in, on the roads and there's people. And uh, one, one thing that I really like when I'm looking at this image is that you see that little um, blanket that's hanging on the, on, the, um, on, on the balcony. Eventually it's gonna disappear. That, there's, that, to, that to me is, is life, right? And, and all that movement that you see and, and the changes through time. So um, this week I went out to sketch the, uh, the canals. And um, the first step that I usually do is to walk around and try to connect with the place. So for those who are um, doing the exercises with us this week uh, and throughout the program, it's always nice to, you know, go, just go outside and, and understand your community, you know, like I did to try to understand a little bit about the history, the, um, the background, the place, you know, maybe look at a map and see how it's kind of uh, planned and, and try to find that connection to that place that you, 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 you want to sit down and, and try to capture. So this is uh, the view that I wanted to and you see this is a canal and you see these old structures, um, some structures that were built to kind of re remind us of the history of, of the lumber industry. And um, you see the boats there as well, um, the same boats that people used to kind of pull, um, pull the logs. And usually when I uh, start to sketch, um, you know, similar to what Chris was showing is, is my kind of doodle um, to start um, lay out the page and kind of occupy the space and negotiate the edges and 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 try to frame uh, the image so this is probably two or three minutes uh, just to kind of um, lay out those um, those those lines and the main elements of of uh, of my subject And then after I do this, um, I would come and, and do a wash. And in this painting in particular, I was very interested to study the, the water and the sky because I feel like there's two ways to see this because it, it, one, one way is to think that the sky and the water is framing the architecture, but the other, the other way around would be to see that the built environment is actually framing the sky and the water. And I felt like this um, view in particular, the subject of, of the water and, and the ripples in it and the reflections and how the sky, you see the, the clouds, um, it's, a, it's a kind of overcast day. I tried to capture that with the wash, but again, this is probably a 15 minute um, a painting that I did on spot. So this is what it looks like. And again, you know, um, this workshop that we've designed is really meant to inspire people 
uh, students to go and sketch the places and, and use sketch as a way to understand a place and connect to it and, and understand it in a way that will help you become better architects, um, feed your design process. Um, so this is what I uh, ended up drawing. And for those of you who don't understand perspective, um, I think one way to, to, to control or, or to kind of lay out your perspective drawings is to just kind of simplify them into, to, into simple boxes. If you look at what I drew here, um, if you kind of understand it as two big boxes, kind of uh, 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 extending its, themselves into that vanishing point, the yellow point at the back, and then you have those three green structures that are um, the wooden uh, shelters. And then you have that big blue uh, space that, that, that's the, the ground or that, the deck that, that, all, that all, all, of this, the, all of these parallel lines are converging into that vanishing point. So if, if, you're, if you can see that and abstract your drawing into the, some very simple shapes, it actually becomes very easy to, um, to draw. But um, after last week's presentation with Sachava, I started to explore a little bit into, um, maybe a little bit more into what uh, Chris was talking about, like the, the drawing the unseen and also drawing sound. So I tried to play the video of, um, of me walking uh, along the canal without looking. So, so that was the video of me walking with my nephews along that path. And I tried to imagine the space without looking at the footage, but just listening to the sound. And what, are, what, what, what were the things that I could capture through sound? Um, and I think this is very important because I also study um, accessible spaces, for example, you know, spaces that are designed for um, people with different disabilities. And um, for example, people see spaces differently, um, you know, whether you're a child or an elderly or uh, someone who doesn't, uh, who, who, are, who is visually impaired. So how, how do you understand space? It, even though you see things differently, I tried to capture that through just listening to how a place sounds like. And a lot of um, clues come from, of course, the, um, the quality of the sound in the sense that there's echo, there's reverberation, and there's the background noise. Um, so I felt like the sound gave me this um, image of something that, that almost feels like a funnel or that you're kind of a little bit underground because of, of the way the sound bounces back to you. We can hear a little bit of, of, of the water and the wind, and we can hear that little um, toy car that kind of sc screeches onto the wooden boards of the deck. Um, and I tried to kind of capture that moment of um, the, the father and the son um, walking along to that, that, that deck. So I think, this, is an, this was an interesting exercise for me to kind of forget about the logics of gravity for one moment, but to start to understand the world in a way that is, is sensed differently and, and, and to understand that architecture and spaces is not just about how it looks, but there's all, all, also the way it, it feels like, the way it sounds like, um, and also the, the different uh, ways that, that, that it uh, impacts the way that you um, experience it. Um, again, this is not, you know, um, an example of a sketch, but rather an experiment. And I want everyone to kind of see it, see it that way. And it, when you're gonna go out to do those assignments um, next week, you know, I, I really want students to try to experiment different things. You know, it's not really about trying to capture that perfect perspective drawing, but really to, to capture, the, um, the, the, the information of the space, trying to capture that mood and character of a space and, and how it informs yourself, you know, try not to impress someone else by, 
you know, coming up with the, the next um, Monet or Raphael or whatever, you know, it's, it's really about uh, a self-reflection and self-exploration. Uh, so I always like to end my presentations with a couple of these things um, called the cross-cultural sketching best practices. We're, we're trying to collect a list of these. So if, if Chris, um, if you have some, some, some items that you want to list into our best practice guide, these are kind of the do's and the don'ts when you're sketching. You know, I think um, in terms of uh, what you need to be aware of when you're um, uh, sketching, especially something that's set culturally sensitive. Um, I had a list that I, I came up with last week that was more focused on um, try to be mindful of the local culture. But this week, my experience, um, and, and this is, is, is all my own opinions and, and how I kind of um, experience my, my sketching this week. Uh, first of all, don't feed the local animals because I had a, a little bag of chips and um, if, if you're there sketching, you, you would find that the birds and the cats will come and make a circle around you. Um, don't disturb the local plants and landscapes, especially when you're choosing a place to sit. Um, don't pollute the water by throwing waste and washing your brush. Um, and be careful not to drop anything into the water. Um, my experience was that my, my nephew actually dropped his toy car into the river and we still have to go and go back and get it. Um, this is a picture of me uh, stationed uh, at a corner of the street. So what I would encourage people to do is to make sure you bring your own water bottle if you need to wash your brushes. Um, it's cold outside, even in Tokyo. I was freezing after 10 minutes being outside. So actually the last couple of minutes of my drawing was done in the, in the hotel lobby. Um, bring something to sit on and, and make sure you follow the local COVID rules in Japan masks are worn even outdoors. So just a friendly reminder. And I also have my one-year-old son who's kind of following me on these little excursions these last couple of weeks. And this is what he came up with. And this is just a gentle reminder that um, Picasso once said that it took him four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. So just a, a reminder to myself to always be curious um, and also follow my instincts. Uh, I think that's something that, you know, with more and more training, I start to forget, but um, I think this is where we always want to come back to. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end my presentation and I'll pass it to, uh, to David. Thanks so much, Henry. I particularly love that um, sound drawing. That was just beautiful. Um, and we'll uh, pass it to you, uh, David. Thank you. And thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Henry. And thanks, Chris. Uh, Kristen, do you want to, shall we break for a few minutes? Uh, we or certainly we, could. Do we, do we have a break for two or three minutes and people can get a cup of coffee or whatever and come back? It's up to you. I'm, I'm okay either way. Um, why don't, why don't we go ahead and do that? We can just just two or three minutes, and then we'll and then we'll start start with David. Great. Perfect. In that case, I'll get a glass of water. Thanks.
Kristen, I'll go ahead and um, set up the screen. Make sure the technology is still working. Okay, great. And I'm just, as a reminder to everyone, I'm just going to put the um, the recording theater link into the um, into the chat, it's just as a reminder for everyone where they can find the recordings. Um, There's the recording there now from last week's uh, teaching session and also um, Se Chaba and my uh, feedback sessions. So that's it. Uh, that's there now. Okay, um, David, do you want to go ahead and, and get started? Sure, sure. I think uh, everybody who's going to be here is probably here. Thanks so much. Okay, I, it's, I, I think this, um, this whole uh, exercise, uh, we had this conversation earlier this morning, is becoming more and more interesting. The areas of overlap, um, you know, here we are, you know, three corners of North America, uh, Eastern Canada, Western Canada, Southwestern US. Um, we're, coming into the, we're coming into these workshops with uh, not a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion uh, behind us, but, but there's, there's been no, um, you know, comprehensive sharing of images, no diagramming of who's going to say what. And it's remarkable to me how much overlap there is between the ideas that we think are important and how we connect them to our own personal experiences with this kind of drawing. Uh, whether it's the kind of drawing that Chris is talking about, which is very familiar to, to Henry and to myself, or the kind of drawing that Henry and I are talking about, which is very familiar to Chris, and I think to Sachaba also from last week. So um, it's going to be very interesting, Kristen and Douglas, if you're still there, to start to think about how we might be able to uh, take, take these um, compact presentations and maybe reorganize them, reorder them, to look at different you know, combinations of, of how they connect and how they, how they overlap. Uh, I'm trying something different with this one, very different from what, I'd, what I tried to do last week. Uh, last week, for those of you who weren't here, I focused the... Um, my conversation about the idea of the architect's sketchbook, the whole issue of why architects draw, how architects draw, the lessons uh, to be learned from remembering how we drew as children is a favorite topic of mine, which I went into very briefly last week and may come back to uh, in one of the later workshops. Um, but this time I was thinking about uh, roots and where we come from. You know, Henry, Henry referred to his experience as a student with me as a teacher. Um, and I thought about my own experience with different teachers, uh, both as a student and in some cases as a colleague. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, there was an opportunity here to go back to some of those teachings, which, which are, I think, like many of like many of us, take for granted sometimes in the moment. But uh, you know, with the benefit of a little bit of experience, and with the challenge of doing what we're trying to do here. I find myself looking back on, on the notes I took in those days uh, under a very different light. So I'm talking about the idea of connecting uh, and I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, Henry and I have known each other as student and teacher and now colleagues for many years, but we're also both beneficiaries of the teaching legacy of a great drawing teacher at McGill who died about 20 years ago. His name was Gentile Tondino, but everyone called him Jerry. Um, he was a celebrated Canadian artist uh, and an unforgettable teacher. And he often liked to answer questions with questions, uh, which, 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 which was kind of irritating at the time when you really needed to, you thought you really needed to know something. And it's only years later that, that we understand, again, with the benefit of a little experience and a little bit of age, that in fact, the answer that we received was exactly the answer that we, we, we needed 
at, at, at that moment. But I'll give you an example. I remember a student many years ago who had been approached in some small Eastern Canadian town by a tourist who wanted to buy his sketch. Uh, the student was of course delighted and, and thinking what better way to cover the cost of this sketching field trip. And then he went to Professor Tardino and asked him how much he should charge, feeling pretty good about the whole experience. And Jerry's reply was, how much do you need? And this, uh, this, this kind of re response we, we would learn over the years uh, was more and more uh, you know, characteristic of his teaching style. Uh, it was also Jerry Tondino who first introduced the format that we talked about last week. You know, this idea of a divided page with a, with a small thumbnail at the upper left, the final larger sketch or the more developed sketch on the right, and, and one or two areas where you might test cross-hatching technique or a bit of a watercolor wash or even, or even experiment with mixing. Um, and by the way, Jerry would always warn students that when they start sketching, and I'm sure Henry remembers this experience, that when they start sketching, their thumbnails uh, would be a lot more interesting than the so-called finished sketches, which, which, make, which means that the challenge for many of us starting sketching is to make the, the big drawings as successful as the little drawings are, uh, as, as spontaneous, as uninhibited, and as free from fear of mistakes and so on and so forth. Uh, Tondino also developed a series of exercises that uh, were designed to get students used to the act of sketching, to the idea of subject versus object, uh, and especially, and we come now to the theme of this presentation, uh, to the need to make a connection with the subject. Uh, Jerry often talked about the importance of this idea of connection with the subject. In one memorable class discussion, he suggested that when, what it comes down to is this, you, you, when you're sketching, you're in a kind of a relationship uh, with the subject. And he used to say, you know, resolve that, take care of that, and the picture will take care of itself, stroke by stroke. And as Chris and Henry have both said earlier today, layer by layer. When you're sitting in front of the subject, Jerry would say, and collecting information, you, you have made that, that connection. What we're seeing on the screen now uh, are the exercises, one of the exercises of one student uh, in one of the recent sketching school program. This is Quebec City in 2017. And on the right, uh, some of you will remember from last week, the, uh, the, our recommendation for how the book should be broken down. I'll say a little bit more about that here. So, uh, so here are the basic exercises. Uh, these are not required. Uh, nobody's going to, but we, we will look at them critically if you, if you want to talk about them with us. But um, we, we suggest that you think about them because it's a way of, as, as I noted here, uh, it's like stretching, you know, before going out for a run. It's the kind of thing that, that some architects I know, uh, that we all know, do every time they go out with, into the field with their sketchbooks. So we start by uh, dividing the page as shown here for the purposes of, of these exercises. And then we ask you to make 20 quick sketches, uh, two to three minutes each. You've got to be disciplined here. Use your smartphone if it helps or, or, how, or work in teams with, with two or three of your classmates or a friend or a family member, but you really have to follow that timing. The temptation to turn every two to three minute study into a work of art, something that will maybe start life behind a magnet on the fridge door and end up behind glass on the wall is overwhelming. But that's not the point of these exercises. The point of exercises is to understand something about the process. Uh, and we also ask for, these, for this first hour of drawing. It's only an hour, 20 drawings, three minutes each. Uh, we ask that you work quickly, keep your pencil moving and do not lift it off the page. Uh, last week, we talked about the notion of starting by claiming the boundaries, left to right, use the horizon. Uh, the far boundary of a distant field, uh, claim the vertical axis, a telephone pole, the, the corner of a building, a, a tree, uh, a line of shadow. Uh, develop the drawing in layers, each of these drawings. We're still talking about the three minute sketches. Uh, you make a series of passes, left to right, top to bottom. Keep pushing the drawing from the center to the edges, out to the edge of the frame. When you find yourself stuck in the center, and you will be, because the temptation to focus on something that you thought was important, a sign uh, or, a, or a dormer window or an architectural detail. That, that temptation is overwhelming, but it's not, a, it's not appropriate. It's not, 
conducive to the kind of sketching that we're trying to promote. So when you find yourself stuck in the center on a chimney stack or a fire hydrant or a car, go back to the subject, search it for cues that allow you to take the drawing back out to the boundary. It could be a telephone wire, the edge of a cloud, the line of distant hills, a crack in the asphalt, the path of a seagull flying across the page. Follow it with your pencil. And all of a sudden you, you find you're free. You made it back out to the boundary. That's part one, one hour. Part two, 30 minutes, four drawings, seven or eight minutes each, you know, four thumbnails. The thumbnails are getting bigger and the time frame is getting a little longer. And at this point, we encourage you to start using shading or cross hatching to so that you can start looking at the importance of light. And then finally, uh, you know, for the for part three, uh, uh, 30 minutes, two sketches, 15 minutes each, divide the page into two and uh, develop both the uh, contour, in other words, the line and the values, the shading and the cross hatching in layers. You're not, you're not making a, a, you're not making a contour drawing or a line drawing and then filling it in with value in this case or with color, you know, in another workshop. We're asking you to, to uh, look at the information for what it is and we'll talk about how you uh, can dematerialize that. Um, let's move on. Uh, is it a coincidence that this group of students uh, at a workshop in the lower St. Lawrence River are all looking at their sketchbook and not at the subject? Why is that? I'm always baffled by the amount of time in a three minute sketch when we start that we actually spend looking at the drawing and not the subject. It should be the other way around. In fact, uh, you know, these, these kids quickly learn that they're gonna have to spend a lot more time looking at the subject, searching the subject for those cues that allow them to, to lay the image down in layers, uh, searching for the, searching the subject, if they're gonna be able to resolve this complexity and make that essential connection that Tondino talked about. The next three slides uh, show the same exercises that we're suggesting you do um, from a morning workshop on the McGill campus by one of our students, Felicity Lee at our most recent sketching school. Uh, this was uh, just last summer, last August. Henry joined us for most of that. On the right, is one of her very first experiments, already making three minute sketches that leave us wondering actually what, what's outside that frame. And this is one of the ways we test the student's ability to actually use the frame like a kind of window into a much larger subject. subject. The frame limits the sketch, but the subject of course has no boundary. So that line, that neutral line that we ask students to draw within becomes very important as a, as a kind of metaphor for a window into the much larger subject. Uh, uh, these, these are actually quite accomplished. Uh, she's kept the pencil moving, I think, more or less. Uh, she's a little bit timid. That'll change, you'll see very quickly. It already changes in the drawings on the left where we're seeing, a, a, where we're seeing actually great progress. Um, at this stage, the drawings reveal a very high level of comfort with this process. She's working the entire frame both on the left and on the right, but not with the same level of information. Some areas of interest retrieve or receive more attention than others, especially in the drawings on the right, where the, where the opportunity to crosshatch, crosshatch and shade opens up a whole new set of possibilities related to light and shade. There's always a tendency, uh, I, th I think any of you who have started to draw yet will recognize, to try to make everything the same. We tend to look at a building across the street uh, or a forest and, and, and we say, well, all those trees are identical. All those windows are identical. They're not. And, and one of the reasons why we, why we ask students, for example, to uh, keep the pencil moving is because you, you find when you're looking only at the drawing with your, with your pencil moving that it becomes pretty demanding. And that it's, at some point the pencil says to you, uh, Dave, Henry, Chris, I need more information. Uh, you, you can't simply push me around. These windows are all different. They're reflecting different parts of the sky. Some are open, some are closed, some have curtains, some have people in them for crying out loud. Take a look. Uh, and we have to respond to these kind of voices. You have to look for the differences be between the elements in the subject and, and, not, and not just the similarities. Um, by this time, at the end of the first morning, uh, Felicity is, is absolutely comfortable with the exercise and developing images that can be actually read like parts of a storyboard. 
this particular set of examples is also a nice example of another lesson of Tondino's, the notion that when we sketch, we're actually uh, collecting things. I referred to this earlier. Um, what are we collecting? We're collecting ideas, we're collecting information, we're collecting insight, in this case, about the McGill campus. And for me, this metaphor of sketching as collecting is magical in a way. It opens up uh, all kinds of opportunities. Here's another example of connection, uh, also from last summer by a, by a student who is not yet quite as accomplished or as comfortable with the student who did the studies we just looked at, but, but who's making great strides. In this exercise, this student used the experience of the morning workshop to develop a series of windows on the left that actually explored different areas of the subject on the right. A pretty, a pretty, uh, a, 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 an entirely intuitive and I would say a remarkable leap from those drills to an exercise where he's making a real connection with a very complex subject on the right. Uh, given the topography and the contrast between the buildings in the foreground and the tower in the background. Um, in fact, we generally encourage students to use exercises like these to literally to take a look around to explore, to connect one study to the previous one by zooming in or out, by shifting the center of interest. And in this way, uh, even these kinds of studies, drills can be read like a kind of, like a sort of diary. Here's a, what for me was a, a wonderful example of someone having made a, a true connection with the subject, using the little thumbnail at the very top in the center to establish a very clear sense of context and the two views uh, on either side in the main part of the page where she shares her discoveries and adds information. Her use of a caption is also extremely interesting to us. Further evidence of her connection with the subject and providing what for some students uh, will be an opportunity to add another dimension uh, using text reflection. We've seen wonderful examples where students recorded parts of conversations with passers-by you know, it could be a passerby saying, do you know who, who lived in, you know, pointing to that bay window on the left? Somebody might say, do you have any idea who lived there? And, and of course you don't, or you may not. And you say, no, tell me. And it might've been a famous writer, an artist, or it might've been their brother-in-law for all we know. But that kind of information reinforces the idea of connection and, and adds meaning and richness uh, to, the, to the image. Uh, this girl, Fo Wu, uh, left the site knowing uh, a heck of a lot more than she did when she started. And now I think all of us have learned a little something as well. Titles can also be useful in our attempt to say something about context. This is actually one of my very first sketches. I have no memory at all of making this drawing and I'm grateful that my father added a title and a date. That's apparently, I learned years later, that's Aunt Lika in the airplane uh, by me when I was age three and a half. So we sometimes encourage students when they're struggling with this notion of connection to actually think about the idea of title and to use that sometimes um, uh, as part of a strategy to add another layer of meaning to the, to the drawing and to the exercise. Whether you use the thumbnails on the page or keep a separate notebook, the process of experimenting with the composition and framing, which is what you're seeing here on the left, is another way of reinforcing your connection to the subject. Here we are in St. John Harbor, New Brunswick. The sketches on the left are, re are records, if you like, transcripts of conversations between several of us who were teaching with students about where they are or where they were and exactly what they were looking for. On the coast of Maine in a place called Perkins Cove, as I, uh, I think I showed you this one last week. And as I mentioned last week, we use these thumbnails, whether they're part of the final page or in a separate notebook to test ideas about composition, light and shade, even color. Uh, sometimes uh, all of us keep separate notebooks and sometimes we use the other notebook as a separate kind of log or journal or diary, if you like. Uh, uh, another strategy used by many architects to experiment, to explore a place with quick sketches. And these kinds of sketches are often done standing up. Uh, sometimes when you're actually moving or in a moving vehicle, could be slow moving vehicle like a horse drawn cart or, a, or a, a, a barge on a canal in Amsterdam. And they're often done uh, while standing and leaning against a wall or leaning against a rail. 
You saw this landscape last week, a place called the Caves near St. John, New Brunswick. That's the Atlantic Ocean on the right. 10 or 15 minutes is enough time to take your pencil for a walk, to quote Paul Clay, mm -hmm. to introduce yourself to the subject and initiate a kind of conversation, which is how Tondino liked to think about the relationship that we create with the subjects. I did this one sitting with a colleague, uh, Ricardo Castro, while we were waiting for lunch in a little cafe that overlooked uh, this part of the beach. And I went back later and uh, explored ways to deal with it at a slightly larger scale and in another medium. Last week, we talked about drawings like this in relation to how we can sometimes use, the, in this case, the geological information of the strata at an angle on, on, in these forms as cues in the way we make our drawings. On the left, a couple of studies of the geometry of Orthodox churches, which you saw last week. Uh, and it, and we, we find that revisiting the same site or similar building types can also be productive and instructive. It's a lot like bumping into someone that you knew very well, but haven't seen for a long time and finding yourself picking up the conversation where you left off. The drawing on the right, which hasn't reproduced very well, uh, was part of an exercise with students a couple of years ago. That's a building that I first visited when I was 10 years old. It's on the McGill campus and is a museum that was built in the late 1800s. I never tire of the discovery that taking your sketchbook to a familiar place, a place that you thought you knew and making the familiar strange can create one of the most powerful of the kinds of connections that we make with the subject. Here's another beautiful example from 2017 in Quebec City, where one of our students explores different ideas about the subject and the media uh, in, in her search of an iconic building in Quebec City, uh, developed in this case in a triptych format. And the whole thing about eight and a half by 11 or A4. This is a church near my home. I've lived in this area for 40 years and finally created an opportunity to make some drawings of it for an exhibition about two years ago. Um, and, and there's there's the sketch of the of the of the church. Uh, uh, this church, Saint Joachim or Saint Joachim in Point Claire, was completed in 1883, more or less, and it's the fourth to be constructed on that site. Like most of the churches along the Saint Lawrence River, it actually faces the river, in sharp contrast to the to the teachings of the church. My intention in the drawing was focused not so much on the church as a building, but on the river actually, and on the church's relationship to it. Here's a fragment of, the, of a nautical chart for this part of the St. Lawrence River. And you'll see in that red circle, the, the spire or the steeple uh, clearly marked. In fact, the steeples were and still are treated as, as aids to the navigation, to the European navigation of the river. And I've seen references, in fact, on old charts that even describe the particular characteristics of a steeple. You know, for example, octagonal spire or, or open or belfry. Another kind of connection is illustrated in these two studies of a typical street in the small city of Montpós on the Magdalena River in Colombia. Uh, I was there many years ago with a colleague, Professor Ricardo Castro again, and a group of 10 students. And we were, we were all interested in and very curious about those distinctive bay windows that lined every street. You see them on the left in the pencil drawing and in the little uh, watercolor sketch at the, at the top. We, we soon found the answer um, and we're, we're delighted uh, when we had an opportunity to visit the inside of one of those houses where we saw behind each of those bay windows a kind of a window seat built in. And we found at various times of the day, those seats filled with the residents of the homes who would literally park there in a kind of uh, communal, you know, social encounter on the, on the sidewalk. Um, we were delighted to see them in use with the residents and passersby and animated conversations. And by the way, uh, in that sketch on the left, notice how the overhead wires uh, resolve the space of the sky in the drawing and how the joints in the road reveal information, not just about the nature of the surface, but also about the actual space of the street an idea that we hopefully will come back to later on. And finally, one more comment about these drawings. We speak often about the possibility of attaching a kind of narrative, a story to the drawings that we make. It's equally important to recognize and understand the narrative behind the subject in front of us and around us. 
whether it's why the church in Point Claire near my house faces the river and not, and not in the usual direction, the opportunity to discover and possibly reveal the narrative of my drawings should be irresistible. One of my favorite ways to connect with the subjects that interest me is to bring along extra pencils, brushes and watercolors and sketchbooks for curious onlookers, mostly kids who typically are, are seven or eight or nine years old. Any younger than that, they're a little shy. Older, they're too busy with other things to, to worry about a stranger making a drawing of a house they walk by every day of their lives. On the left is a sketch I made many years ago, the house in New Brunswick, on the coast in New Brunswick, where my mother was born. And on the right, uh, simultaneous treatments by, by two neighborhood kids who happened by, were very curious about what I was doing and who welcomed the opportunity with materials that I gave them to not so much mimic what I was doing, but to maybe try to figure out what I found so interesting in a house that they took for granted. Uh, this kind of connection, wonderful for me. Uh, in this case, back in Colombia, in Monpos, while most of the kids who gathered around me, uh, this was towards the end of the day, were wondering if that little burro in, in front of the door would leave before the sketch was finished. I think they might've been betting on, on whether it would leave or stay. Uh, there was one young guy who, were drawing, who was drawing beside me with the materials that I gave him. And he surprised me when he added the two decorations on the wall above the door to the chapel in that, in that slightly enlarged image on the right. And I confess, i have been sitting in front of that, uh, uh, this little sort of uh, plaza uh, in the center of this extraordinary little town for about two hours, maybe 90 minutes at that point. And I hadn't actually seen those, those, those ornaments. The light was dim, it was towards the end of the day and they were very, in very shallow bas relief. And in the fading light of the early evening, I hadn't even noticed. So I got up and I walked over there and sure enough, there they were. Whether, whether my, uh, my companion, the little guy drawing beside me, whether he saw them and yesterday, Kristen and Henry and I were talking about how we forget how sharp our eyesight is at that age. Now, whether he actually saw them or whether he drew them because he knew they were there, the incident reminded me how important it can be to actually walk the site, to get up and walk around. In fact, I think it's fair to say that most of the people that we know who do this kind of sketching are always not only looking around, but also getting up and exploring the subject from different viewpoints, just to get a better sense of, of where they are and, and why they're there. Another one of our students, Philippa Swartz in Quebec City, this is actually 2017, not 2021. She's able to make a connection with the winding and narrow streets of, of that uh, celebrated, the old part of the celebrated city by overlaying in the drawing on the left, a vague kind of memory of what might be the street plan of that part of the city with the, with the, with the very elegantly expressed experiential view down below. And, and the fearlessness, fearlessness with which she's able to combine these separate kinds of drawings recalls, uh, I think, the, uh, some of the ideas that Chris was sharing with us earlier and, and that uh, Henry uh, is now expressing an interest in when he uh, wonders about the idea of drawing sound or finding a way to express sound as, as one of the many aspects of a subject that, that we know about but are unseen. And finally, on the subject of walking, I'll, I'll close very quickly with one more essential kind of connection. It's one that's familiar to all the architects uh, in the call, in the virtual room. Uh, it's the storyboard, or to use the term coined by Gordon Cullen in his 1961 book, Townscape, Serial Vision. Serial Vision simply refers to a strategy, a little bit like the example that I just shown, showed you by the student in Quebec City. But serial vision refers to a strategy where a series of sequential views is developed along a path that is also itself documented. I blew it up on the right hand side of the image in front of you. We recommend this as a, an exercise. And Francis Ching, uh, to whom we've referred already in some of these workshops, also talks about the power of serial vision in one of his own blogs. Um, he's become, he's a celebrated teacher and author about, of many books on drawing. Uh, has become very active with urban sketchers, uh, in particular with the Seattle urban sketchers. And this is one of the blogs that uh, he maintains with many examples of his work there. And what he does here is describe a, a walk 
uh, on the Seattle, um, uh, with the uh, uh, Seattle Urban Sketchers across the uh, UW campus, the University of Washington campus. And they, they describe, he says, how you approach the library from across Red Square, enters one of the portals, uh, moves through the lobby and then up the main staircase, then arrives in the main room. So I'll just walk you through them. Uh, Frank Ching likes to work in, in ink for the most part. I asked him why, and he said he just, he loves the feeling of the clean sweep of the nib across a fresh piece of paper. When, it would, you know, when I show him my pencil drawings, he says, I should work more in pencil. And when, I, when he shows me his ink drawings, I say, I say to myself, I should get back to ink. So if, that's, if that means anything to anyone, uh, play with both media when you have the opportunity. These drawings actually look like they, I think they're ink. And they are remarkable. You can look at them at greater leisure later on. We're getting close to the end. We've climbed the staircase on the left. We're just about to enter the reading room of the library and there we are. Uh, why do architects draw? I mentioned last week and Henry reminded us a few minutes ago uh, of, of many of the reasons and for Francis Ching, it's for pleasure to understand, to see, and to remember. I'll leave you with just this kind of um, lesson, if you like. Uh, try, to, try to treat the act of sketching, as Kristen uh, mentioned at the, in the introduction, as a strategy for the acquisition of knowledge and understanding. It's a, it's a forgiving process, and don't be afraid of making mistakes. Treat the rituals associated with the kind of sketching that we do as providing a structure for your encounters with things and places that interest you, but resist your first attempts to describe them on paper. Open your mind. You heard Chris earlier say, don't make judgments. Abandon all preconceptions you might have about what you think is or isn't important in the subject. Don't try to edit the drawing before you actually understand what you're seeing. If it helps, Remove the labels like tree, roof, car. Imagine that you're seeing everything for the very first time and trying to understand what it is and how it got there. You'll soon discover that your drawings are recording not only what you saw, but also what you learned. And, and finally, just three more slides, just to recall some of the lessons from uh, our mentors uh, that we, sh we shared last week. Ari Matisse, uh, who talked about drawing as putting a line around an idea and Paul Clay who described it as an active line on a walk. I read just yesterday uh, of a conversation between Paul Clay and Joseph Albers, where Clay advises Albers to literally take a line for a walk. Uh, William Mitchell, whom some of you may know by reputation, uh, talking about drawing with a free hand as a little bit like dancing on paper. Henry talked about uh, drawing as a child. And Saul Steinberg, uh, I remembered, I mentioned last week, as having confessed that, and I quote here, where he says, I'm among the few who continue to draw after childhood has ended, continuing and perfecting childhood drawing without the traditional interruption of academic training. So it's not just us or Picasso, whom Henry cited a few minutes ago. And finally, I'll, I'll stop here with a note from our, our mentor, uh, Jerry Tondino, who in response to a question from a student about the about an issue in, in one of their drawings, simply said to the student, do you wanna be perfect or do you wanna be interesting? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't go on too long. Thank you so much, David. Um, at, at this point, we'd like to uh, open it up to any questions that people have about um, any of the things you heard today or if the three, um, if David, and Henry and Chris, if you'd like to um, discuss any of the, the overlaps or, or, or issues brought up with between your presentations, that would be great as well. If people want to either just raise their hand or put a question in the chat, I'll keep an eye on the chat box and um, we can ask questions that way. Um, to get it started, I had I had a question for well, I have a question for Chris and one for Henry, but uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit more about what you meant with um, drawing when you don't know what to draw? Because I think we've all been faced with that at one point or another. And, um, and uh, I, was, I was interested by um, your process there. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> most people would call it doodling, right? Like, but I, I think that 
to me that that term sort of devalues the act of doing it i found that if i was just drawing anything like literally anything uh in the video i showed you it was just about moving the pencil um if if you're drawing the these things then ideas start to come up um i'll share with you one thing in one of the drawings that i showed um that let's see um one of the ideas for the series of drawings that i did came up came out of uh, the exact drawing. Everyone can see that, right? Yes, we can see it. Can you, can you see my cursor when I move it across? Yes, yes. Okay. This drawing right here it was where I started that domicile series of drawings. That was the idea. It just came out of that volume, the idea that something was raised above, there was some interesting. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to put that idea in the sketchbook and I was I think there were a number of weeks where I would just sit in the Barnes and Noble and just draw like this like just draw a thing just there are many spreads in my sketchbook like that so that idea came out of that this this idea here um where I was beginning to think what how could I make a panelized thing cladding that would look like feathers and what would that actually look like could I replicate the same thing I ended up using that, if you know my work, my piece that I did in Columbus, Indiana. Um, that idea, I would say, when I drew it, was probably three or four years before. So sometimes ideas come and I just need to draw them and make them without thinking about how they're applied. Um, and so it's just about drawing anything, to be honest. If it's a shape, it's a form, you know, like this, this thing here um, is just about form and shape. It's not anything. So it's just like, but I always use the, the, the clay quote too about taking your pencil for a walk. It's exactly what it is. It's just like, let, let me let this thing move across the page. Um, and then when you're doing that, then the ideas will come. If you sit and look at the blank page, um, the ideas won't come, right? And I think the beauty of like urban sketching is that there's a subject in front of you. So there is something to draw. And so once you start drawing that thing, I do the same thing when I when I am travel and sketching in, in, in those situations. Um, and I like the Henry's example of the blanket that goes away. Like I would have been very fascinated with that. And like, can I draw that thing? Uh, can I draw the traffic that's moving across the bridge? Um, how can I begin to focus on these things that are actually dynamic within this thing that we think is uh, just static? Chris, it's, it's David here. Have you had a chance to draw at a rodeo yet? No, I I, rec I recommend it. I did it. That, in was, that would be amazing. I, could. I, did, I did it in a place called Edson, Alberta, many years ago. Uh -huh. and, I, and I realized that the cowboy that I drew getting thrown from a horse wasn't that particular cowboy. It was all the cowboys that got thrown there. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it, it's a wonderful exercise. Yeah. You'll get lots of opportunities. I think I think this, um, one of the things that that went across some of the talks too was the the idea of you know not, not getting caught up in the preciousness of the drawing, which I think yeah. is something we all fall into doing. Uh, I love to draw on a roll of of trace. You can see it in the background of behind me here, just for that exact reason, because in my mind, trace isn't a precious paper, and so. And I love, like you were talking about, Chris, I love to be able to add the transparencies of putting things underneath it and, and adding to the drawings that way. Um, so I think that's something else to really keep in mind for, this, for the uh, students is to not get caught up in that preciousness of, of drawing and, the, and, and that, that sort of self-editing and so on. Um, so. Um, Which is one of the reasons why we like notebooks like the moleskin that are bound. You know, they, they lie flat and you and you can't tear the pages out. I started using them on a trip, my my first trip to Italy. And yeah. I had bought this bigger sketchbook. I was like, yeah. I'm gonna make some amazing drawings with this huge sketchbook. <laughs> <laughs> then I opened the thing and it was like, this feels like it's a thousand oh. pounds. Like I can't 
I couldn't draw. And then I bought the moleskin actually in Italy, the small, mm -hmm. the smallest one, the pocket one. And that's when I really started drawing. Yeah. It that I found that just changing the format changes the yeah. way that I think and drew. Yeah. It's it's a great point. And of course in Italy they call them moleskine, but <laughs> uh, the uh, we encourage our students to draw across the binding whenever they can, because it in a way going Kristen, going back to what you were saying, it, it makes it less precious. You know, you, the pencil actually skips, it trips. I've broken leads. You know, uh, you know, you Chris, when you take the line for a walk, sometimes the pencil gets out of control. It's got a mind of its own. You know, I didn't want it to go that way across that binding, but it does it by itself. It leaves a little bit of the tip, you know, lodged in the binding. It's all part of the process. Um, I'd also like to bring up about the um, about the, the feedback sessions. Um, this Friday, it will be uh, Chris and I in the morning and um, David and Henry in the evening session. And we just uh, wanted to sort of reach out and ask if people have any suggestions on how to um, sort of share your work so that you feel comfortable. The um, like we had suggested putting your names on the box on the squares in the gallery. If you're not comfortable with that, that's also totally fine. If you want to just use a number or a nickname. Um, and also just to, I just wanted to quickly show after the, after the um, session last week, we, somebody had asked how, you know, how do we, how do we um, include the different ideas and different um, uh, perspectives that we've heard that we'd heard from Sechaba and from Chris and Henry. And so I just wanted to quickly share a quick drawing that I did for that last week, just to give people an idea. I started with much more the traditional uh, style of drawing that that Chris and, and uh, sorry, that um, David and Henry had talked about. And then you can see how this evolved into the sort of um, the addition of the presence of the, the of the eagle in the tree outside. Um, and the crow and, and the, the clothesline, the, the wind, showing the wind um, and so on. And so kind of, the, um, the, and, and it was a beautiful process of, of, again, letting go of feeling like I had to um, perfectly draw what, 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 I was, what I was looking at. And then on, on Sunday morning, I was just playing around. I was just feeling really agitated and I was thinking about ten, uh, the, the drawing we've been doing. And again, I just started making these these um, figures uh, after after um, after uh, Sechaba's talk, and then he and I talked again on the in, in between, and um, just thinking about what it is that was you know this sort of agitated feeling I was having about it, and what it was impacting that, and how that grew from being just about what was going on within me to what was around me to the notion of you know, is it just me on, on the land as we know it, or is it these other influences playing around with, you know, these are these, are these kind of cool neon Prismacolor pencils that, um, you know, I felt like captured the, the energy that I was feeling myself. And so, but you can see these figure drawings are not, they're just, you know, they're, they're just, they're just figures, and there's there was no need to make this be a beautiful figure of a of a of a person, and it because that actually wasn't at all what it was about. Um, so, uh, so you'll just from looking at these few things that we have up here, you'll see that there is all kinds of different um, sorts of of um, styles and levels of drawing, and um, so that. You know, people don't, there's some beautiful ones down here that that Ken put on. Um, you know, just so you don't feel shy about, uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> we all sort of have this need to, to, to think we have beautiful drawings. And um, it's really just about the act of drawing. And, and I'm, I have to say, I'm so grateful for the sketching school because I, I'm just sketching more and, and uh, how much I'm enjoying that. So um, if, if there are other things that we could do, um, you're, you're welcome to 
email me or to uh, uh, just raise your hand now or put something in the chat so that we can encourage people to, to come to these feedback sessions because arguably they're almost even more important than, than the lectures because it gives you the opportunity to actually interact with the um, with other people around your drawing and uh, drawings and, and just you know talk about them and, and talk about if there are specific things that you that you're um, working on and get some and get some feedback about that. And um, it's just like Sechaba and I recorded our conversation about these drawings, which is available. You can listen to it over here. It's recorded here and on the website. Um, we ended up just having a great conversation for an hour around, around drawing. And um, so really think about it that way, as opposed to putting your work up there, you know, to sort of be critiqued. Um, it's just a, it's just a great opportunity to talk about drawing and art and what it's like to draw and um, and I think it's a really as 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 Chris started with it's a really healing process and uh, so hopefully um, we can we can all enjoy that. Kristen, I, I'd like to just uh, respond to a question in the chat. Um, Jenna is asking if there's going to be two feedback sessions. So uh, yes, Jenna, there's going to be. So, so the idea was that we wanted to accommodate to everyone um, in different time zones. So we had set apart um, two sessions on Friday, one in the morning at nine o'clock mountain time and the second one at uh, 6 p.m. mountain time. The morning one will be uh, hosted by Kristen and, and Chris and the evening one will be myself and David. And I, I you know, as Kristen said, this is an open invitation for you to join the, the feedback sessions, but I would even say that I, I, I am pleading people to come because I think that the only way that we're going to reach, you know, our goal of getting close to a cross-cultural sketching school is so that um, there is a conversation around these drawings. I think um, it's not about uh, myself, David, and Chris showing our drawings, but um, it's about um, sharing uh, and and me asking Chris, why did you draw it that way? Why, what did you want to represent and how did you approach? What was the process? What, how did you think um, through that process? How did you choose those that medium and how did you choose that style of representation? I think those kind of conversations will is what's going to happen at these feedback sessions. And I think that's um, that's critical to to the to to this to this uh, exercise that we're doing. So um, I invite people to come to to the Friday sessions, and I I, I would even um, say please please come <laughs> to the Friday sessions. We need we need you. Exactly, um, and and it's also I'd really like to encourage people to try. Um, the things that you hear during the week. Like I had such a great time trying the things that, um, that uh, Chris and, and uh, or sorry, that David and, and Henry and Sechaba brought last week and, the, and look forward to what Chris and um, brought in this week. And for sure, Henry, I'm gonna try one of your sound drawings this, uh, this week as well, because I was really intrigued by that. Um, because among other things, I found it just a really freeing process of, you know, um, just kind of allowing myself to 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 draw in a different way and 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 to let go of some of the preconceptions I have about what a drawing should be. Hi, uh, Kristen. Kristen is David. I wonder if. Um... I would be, I'd be interested in knowing from anyone who intends to participate in the last two workshops, if there's any particular topic that they would like to see covered. Is there someone particularly interested, for example, in how they might want to, how they might start in watercolor or, um, you know, Chris and I both spent a lot of time working on in moleskins. 
Moleskins don't take watercolor very easily. They, they can to a certain point. I, I know when I sketch in the Moleskin, I use coffee a lot to when I need to add a warm tint. I learned that from a colleague in Mexico many years ago. Um, so if there's any particular topic, Red, red wine works well too, David. Uh, yeah, there's usually not, not much skin. left. Yeah. <laughs> I, I go through it too quickly, but it, it, but it does loosen up the drawing. Exactly. I just wanted to, there was also a question um, about where to find the um, recordings and you can find them here on the Global Studio um, um, theater page. So you'll see, um, here they are here and I'll get today's up um, shortly after we finish today. So. Um, here we have a, a comment from um, Chris Cormier. Fantastic sessions you have going on here. Perhaps setting up one container to hold the drawings for the week's session while being more anonymous and the feedback could be made on drawings without attributing who had done it unless they want to be identified. I am sure I will be uh, clear with this. Um, that's a great idea. And, and that's, you know, if it, again, if you, if people want to put um, their drawings up in the, in the mural board gallery um, without their names and even, you know, David, hadn't you uh, talked about it in your, when you do this in person, you just, you, every people hang drawings and then you just walk around and choose one and talk about it without even saying whose drawing it is or um, so if people are more comfortable with that we can absolutely do that as well as we can just put um, put drawings up and and then we'll just randomly select one and and talk about it so that it becomes a more anonymous process um, we have here from uh, Winoa, uh, I would love to, he he to know more about everyone's watercolor process. These are things I don't know how to start or how to simplify uh, because starting something new, I always tend to overthink and over prepare for. Um, so maybe we can, we could, we can do have either in a feedback session or in um, next week, um, session we can have a bit more about just this, how to how to get started with a with watercolor and sure. um, next week is also Joanna Nash is our collaborator who is a painter so I suspect um, she will be bringing um, quite a bit more of that into into the session Um, another question, maybe a session on tackling large scale drawings, drawings where we really have to sketch our arms, bodies to fill the page and to organize the composition. Great question. Fabulous question. We can do that next week. Um, we have a, a just a, a, a technical question about the mural board. Um, that is uh, to, to enter the password. You should be prompted. Um, there'll be a you enter the you go to the link and you should be prompted to um, to enter your password. Once without the password, you won't be able to edit or move anything. And um, but. But once you've added the password, you should be able to um, go ahead and upload drawings and so on. The one thing, well, the one reminder is just the, the command Z control so that if you move something, which it's easy to do, um, you can just, just move it back. So we ask that you, we don't erase anything. Um, okay, uh, um, does anyone have any final th thoughts or, or comments? Oh, here's a question for Chris. Is there a place online where we can find the work? Oh, sorry, it jumped. Uh, find the work where you were discussing during your artist in residence period. Um, the answer is I, <laughs> I don't recall. I don't think that it's on my website. I, you know, to be honest, my Instagram page 
uh, is the best place to kind of see things. That's the thing I paid most attention to. Um, and I try to be descriptive about the, those types of things. But I, I just wanted to add too that, you know, for the feedback session on Friday, I'd be happy to answer special, specific like technique questions, things, you know, techniques that I use or things that I've shown and um, materials, um, all those kinds of very specific questions that pe people might have. Chris, um, I, Chris, I have a quick question. Do you use colored inks or watercolors? I use watercolors. I use some gouache. The fluorescent stuff you see is gouache. Ah, uh, okay. Just wondering. Yeah. Oh, the solve the moleskin watercolor problem. You know what I, I actually do? I take two, I take two moleskins that are open to the same page. I flip flop them so that the big part is in the small space here. So it lays super flat and I actually clamp it. I clamped the paper down so that it doesn't curl on me. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you pour vinegar over it to take the take the gloss off the page. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we have we have another comment from Ken, uh, who says, "I'm sorry for missing the feedback session. I think one of the reasons I'm a bit gun shy is because I'm not an architecture student. So it seems I am not one of the students the professors and lecturers are targeting for feedback in particular." I will try to show up though. I will try um, for an evening session with Professor Tsang and Kovo to start. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, th I'm glad you brought that up, Ken. And um, because one of the things actually we're really trying to nurture with the Global Studio is to work across disciplines. So um, really try not to feel that because if you're not an architecture student, that you sort of don't, um, don't, you know, have, don't belong in the course or don't, um, you know, you, we won't spend as much time with, with, with your work um, because I think the most interesting thing is to have different perspectives and, and you know, seeing things through the, the different lenses of different um, disciplines is, is really, it makes it so much more interesting for all of us. Um, so for sure, you know, don't feel if you're not an architect that, um, you know, you don't, that you don't, your drawings aren't um, as valued because um, for sure we're, we'd love to see them. And we're looking forward to as well. Um, Say Chaba, Say Chaba, are you still on the, are you still on the call? Um, Say Chaba, who, you know, as you, most of you all know, was our guest speaker last week. Um, he shared the, the recording with his family members in Kuruman, which is, which is uh, a rural, uh, similar to a reserve in Canada in, 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 um, in South Africa. And they were very excited and, and asked why they hadn't been invited to the sketching school and could they post their drawings. So we're hoping that his cousin is gonna post his drawings and participate in the sketching school as well. So, um, so you know, it's, please don't feel that it's sort of centered on architecture. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I think we'll close the session for today. And I just um, like to finally say, thank you so much to everybody who has, um, contributed to this and to everyone who has attended today. It's been a, another great session and very inspiring. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye.